Welcome everyone to the IEA Bioenergy webinar series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. My name is Ronnie Huang and I'll be kicking off today's session. Today is February 21st, 2018 and we are very pleased to have Farrell Lefebvre and Adam Brown today who will present on the IEA Bioenergy Roadmap, Delivering Sustainable Bioenergy. We are also very pleased to have Jim Spaeth, who is the ex-co-chair of IEA Bioenergy on the line with us, as well as Simone Landolina, who is the head of international partnerships and initiatives and the coordinator of the IEA Technology Roadmap program. We'll kick off today's session. To start things off, Ferro Lafafla is based in the Renewables Energy Division of the International Energy Agency and undertakes analysis in the area of bioenergy for heat and power and transport biofuel markets. Originally from Scotland, he holds a bachelor's degree in environmental management and technology from the Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, master's in energy systems and the environment from Strathclyde University in Glasgow, and has a background working in the renewable energy field in local government, energy consultancy, and also energy utility and also undertaking the management of renewable power and heat subsidy schemes for the UK energy regulator OFGEM. Ferro joined the IEA in 2015 and is based in Paris. Our second presenter, Adam Brown, has expert knowledge of renewable energy gained through 38 years experience working with governments and industry internationally. He has broad experience in renewable energy technology and policy analysis. While a member of the Renewable Energy Division at the IEA in Paris, he authored reports on renewable energy policy and policy best, best practice and on renewable heat. He has particular experience and expertise in bioenergy. He was the technical coordinator for the IEA Bioenergy Techno Technology Co Cooperation Program. He authored the bioenergy chapter of the REN21 Global Status Report on Renewables in 2016 and 2017. He was also the author of the IEA's Roadmap on Biofuels for Transport and on Bioenergy for Heat and Power, and led the update of these roadmaps, which was published in November of 2017. With that, I will now pass along to Simone to begin the presentation. Thank you, Thank you. dear colleagues, Thank you. ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simone Landolina. I lead the International Partnerships and Initiatives team at the International Energy Agency. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar to present the new IA Technology Roadmap on Bioenergy that was released at the end of November 2017. I would like to thank all participants for attending this event today, and I would like to especially thank the IA Technology Collaboration Program on Bioenergy, also known as the IA Bioenergy DCP, for co-organizing this webinar in collaboration with the Canadian Institute of Forestry. Bioenergy plays an important role in IA scenarios and analysis relevant to accelerating the clean energy transitions. Since 2009, the IA has produced a range of over 30 global technology roadmaps, covering more than 20 of the key technologies for the energy sector decarbonization, including bioenergy and biofuels. The program has been a considerable success and it has provided recognized guidance to the public and private sectors, in part due to its collaborative nature, evidence-based recommendations on the priorities and steps needed to accelerate technology innovation and deployment, and emphasis on broad stakeholder engagement. So in 2016, we started a new cycle of roadmaps that seeks to further raise the ambition of the program showing policymakers, investors, entrepreneurs when navigating an increasingly diverse and regionally specific energy landscape, how they can jointly act to transform our global energy system. The methodological approach builds on the strengths of the first phase and incorporates some elements of novelty. First, we still have a long-term vision, a vision to 2060, coupled with short-term actions in the immediate 2020. Second, we, uh, the roadmaps are based on a consensus-driven approach, seeking alignment wherever possible with stakeholders that can take forward the roadmap recommendations in the form of action plans. Third, the identification of valuable co-benefits of technology development, such as energy security, economic, economic development, and environmental impacts. Fourth, 
uh, defining uh, milestones to be achieved uh, on the road to realizing the vision and including metrics and indicators uh, to track progress. Fifth, roadmaps taking full account of regional conditions and needs, as well as identification of countries for which the technology could have a particularly high impact. And last but not least, the new series of roadmap provides strategic analysis directly relevant to multilateral efforts, such as under the IA technology collaboration programs or mission innovation. Because of the crucial role of bioenergy in our scenarios, in 2017 we started the new roadmap cycle with not just one, but two titles on bioenergy. In fact, in January 2017, the IA released the How to Guide for Bioenergy. That is a manual co-authored by the IA with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations that provides policymakers and decision makers with step-by-step -step guidance on a methodology to develop and implement national technology roadmaps that are tailored to national or regional capabilities and to the desired level of ambition. Then in November 2017, we published the new IA Technology Roadmap on Bioenergy, and the latter builds on the first edition of the IA Technology Roadmaps on Biofuels for Transport that was released in, back in 2011, and on Bioenergy for Heat and Power that was released in 2012. So importantly, as I already mentioned, this new Bioenergy Roadmap was developed in close collaboration with the IA Bioenergy DCP, but also in consultation with stakeholders under other key Bioenergy partnerships like Mission Innovation, particularly the Challenge Number 4 on Biofuels, uh, the Biofuture Platform, uh, the Global Bioenergy Partnership, GBEP, and a range of other uh, national and international stakeholders. We are really grateful to the numerous experts that have contributed to this process, as we know that together we can have a significant impact in terms of energy security and sustainable economic development. In this respect, the scope of the expertise in the IATCPs is a unique asset to help the global energy transition. And with that, let me thank you very much for your kind attention and interest in this webinar and hand the floor over to the lead authors of this roadmap, Adam Brown, followed by Farah Lefebvre. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Simone. This is Adam Brown. I, Farah and I were the, the lead authors on, on this, but as um, Simone said, we, we had a lot of help from the IA Bioenergy TCP, from uh, and a whole range of other international organizations and stakeholders in this field in doing this. Um, a starting point for our analysis uh, was the, the, the roadmaps we produced in 2011 and 2012, but we felt that since then quite a lot had happened both in the general uh, energy context and in the bioenergy field itself that it was time for us to update and review these this roadmap and produce a new one, so that's what we've, we've done. Um, now, a starting point for this analysis is that, that bioenergy uh, already is uh, an important part of the uh, low energy system. It's, it's the largest contributor of renewables to final energy consumption, about five times the contribution of that and uh, from wind and, and solar, for example, which, which everybody recognizes as very important renewable technologies. Um, so uh, it, 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 it's already uh, an important player in the market and can do even more, particularly because of its flexibility, its ability to contribute in the transport sector to electricity uh, and in the heating sector. But it only makes sense to have an expanded uh, contribution from bioenergy if it's produced and used sustainably. That means that it produces real carbon savings compared with other uh, forms of energy. Um, and it doesn't have other uh, unfortunate uns uh, sustainability impacts. Now, the, 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 because of this um, broad scope for bioenergy and because of its interactions with a whole range of other uh, uh, policy and technology areas, bioenergy is, is, is complex. You can see uh, the, the large number of potential feedstocks, the technologies and end products. And sometimes it's controversial because it impinges on a, on a, a large number of environmental and other areas. 
I, I think what we've, we've come to realize is that, that what isn't helpful in this discussion is, is general statements and oversimplification. It's no good saying biology is good or bad. You really have to get into the, to the detail. Um, there's, I think there's a, a growing consensus about what constitutes a sustainable best practice in, in bioenergy. And um, so uh, so, so we, we, we think that if bioenergy is going to play a, a, an important role in the future low carbon energy system, and, and as our analysis will show shortly, we, we feel it really needs to, then it has to be a, a proper detailed analysis based on up-to-date evidence and experience. Um, so what we thought we would do this afternoon is first, uh, Farah will talk a little bit more detail about the, the current role of bioenergy, where bioenergy plays a role at the moment. And then secondly, where what we've identified as a number of areas where bioenergy could play in the very short term a much expanded role in low carbon energy, a number of examples based on existing well uh, established technologies and practices. Um, when he's finished doing that, I'll talk then a little bit more about the longer term vision that's in the roadmap for the longer term future of bioenergy and also about some of the key steps we think are necessary to unlock this in a way which is uh, sustainable and leads to real carbon savings. So at that I'll hand over to Faro for the first part of this discussion. Thanks Faro. Hello everyone. Um, so Adam, as Adam said, I'm going to present some slides on current bioenergy markets in order to provide some context uh, to the longer term vision which Adam will present later. Um, so why do a, a roadmap on bioenergy in particular? Um, so, so modern bioenergy is the largest renewable energy source um, currently, accounting for around half of all renewables in final energy consumption. And this is of course supported by its suitability for use across the electricity, heat, and transport sectors. And as Adam mentioned previously, um, although there's been a lot of attention on um, the deployment of wind and solar PV in the electricity sector, when you look at the contribution to the whole energy system, uh, bioenergy's contribution was five times bigger than them two combined uh, in 2015. Now, looking at the two, uh, the two graphs on the slide, um, so on the left-hand side, we can see the breakdown of how bi modern bioenergy is used by sector. And on the right-hand side, we can see the relative growth, uh, growth of each of these sectors. So from comparing both the graphs, we can see that while heat uh, uh, accounts for three quarters of all modern bioenergy, it is actually growing at the slowest rate of all the three sectors. Um, and this is a consequence of the relatively fragmented nature of the heating sector, a range of economic and non-economic barriers, and lower levels of policy support. So for example, there are targets for renewable electricity in around 150 countries, uh, compared to less than 50 for renewable heat. Uh, now, conventional biofuel growth has slowed from double-digit expansion pre-2010 to much slower rates uh, due to a combination of economic factors, policy uncertainty, um, and structural barriers related to vehicle fleets and uh, fueling infrastructure in some key markets. Um, and when we see that biomass electricity uh, is actually the smallest in terms of energy terms, but it is growing at the fastest rate. However, it's important to remember that while bioenergy in heat and transport is the major form of renewable energy, it is only one of a portfolio of renewable options in the electricity sector. So now what we can see here is the size of bioenergy's contribution per sector in 2015 from IEA statistics compared to what is required by 2025 in the IEA's two degree scenario or 2DS, uh, which was used to provide the long term vision for the roadmap. So in, by means of explanation, the, the 2DS outlines an energy system uh, until 2060, which is consistent with at least a 50% chance of limiting global average temperature increase to two degrees by the end of the century. Um, and it doesn't just cover bioenergy, it covers the whole energy system. So what we're doing in this roadmap is looking at what the bioenergy contribution to the two degree scenario is and how do we get there. 
Now, through comparing the historical average annual growth in each sector to what is required to keep on track with the 2DS in 2025, reveals that for all sectors, growth rates would effectively need to double. Um, however, our latest five-year market, market forecasts, which uh, the latest version goes out until 2022, indicate that this is currently not happening. So the projected growth in our forecast is slower than what is needed to keep track with the two-degree scenario. Now, for transport in particular, a simply, uh, simply doubling growth doesn't really tell the whole story, as most of the production growth in the two-degree scenario is from advanced biofuels, uh, many of which aren't commercialized as yet. So it's not just a simply a case of policies and market factors to increase growth. There's also a technological element as well. Um, and it should also be noticed, uh, made, made clear, that bioenergy deployment moving forward uh, will need to grow in the context of increasing competition uh, from other decarbonization options. So whether that's electric vehicles in road transport, heat pumps for buildings, or wind and solar PV in the electricity sector. What we will also need to see to achieve accelerated deployment will be an expansion of bioenergy into new markets and also a wider array of applications. So on the left-hand side graph, we can see that transport biofuels production is dominated by a relatively small number of countries, while consumption is still mainly in road transport with limited use in the aviation and marine sectors as yet. On the right-hand side, we can see that biomass is already prominent in certain industry sectors where biomass wastes and process residues are produced. So, for example, uh, the pulp and paper industry. However, expansion into other industries where this is not the case, and you would need to uh, build a fuel supply chain, um, therefore biomass use is, is less evident. Uh, furthermore, in the electricity sector, 90% of all bioenergy capacity in 2016 was located in just uh, 26 countries. That said, our market forecasts do indicate some increased geographical spread for bioenergy, especially in Asian countries, due to a combination of rising energy demand, security of supply drivers, ample feedstock resources, and supportive policies. Now again, to provide context, the focus of the roadmap is how to increase modern bioenergy use to provide renewable heat to industry and buildings, uh, electricity and transport fuels. So that's basically everything on the, the left-hand side of the donut graph. Um, however, it's important to acknowledge that the traditional use of biomass resources for cooking and heating by some 2.5 billion people, uh, primarily in emerging economies and developing countries, still accounts for over half of biomass and waste resource consumption. And of course, this can result in health impacts from indoor air pollution, as well as other societal in, and environmental impacts. And given upward population trends in areas where traditional biomass use uh, takes place, uh, the transition to modern cooking and heating solutions is essential. And the, there is a role here for more sophisticated uh, biomass systems in this area, but it's not only about bioenergy. There are a range of other renewable and non-renewable options uh, to help with energy access. However, as I said, this isn't really the, the focus of the roadmap. So if you're interested in energy access, I would look, uh, recommend you to look to the IEA's 2017 Energy Access Outlook. So now I'm going to share a few slides of analysis from the roadmap regarding the technology options which can scale up in the period up to 2025, uh, so really the, the short to medium term. So in the long term vision, innovation is required to commercialize new bioenergy technologies. However, in the short and medium term, keeping up with the 2DS requires a rollout of proven bioenergy solutions. Um, and as such, we wanted to provide a selection of these, so kind of low-hanging fruit examples. Um, so we've shown here eight on the slide. Uh, and we selected these based on eight uh, predefined selection criteria. So without naming all eight, uh, but these include uh, being technically mature and commercially proven, offering clear greenhouse gas savings versus fossil fuels, and global applicability. Um, many of these solutions rely on waste and residue feedstocks, and therefore have overlapping waste management drivers, 
and limited land use change uh, impact. Um, while another key, key selection criteria we utilized was providing an enabling environment for the next wave of bioenergy technologies. So for example, ethanol consumption at higher ethanol blends enables uh, market prospects for cellulosic ethanol by facilitating suitable vehicle fleets and fuel distribution infrastructure. Um, so for each of the eight solutions shown here on the slide, uh, we included examples, the benefits that could be accrued, and enabling factors uh, both within the roadmap and also a more detailed online appendix. Um, but of course we want to say that this list is not uh, exhaustive as there is a much wider array of bioenergy solutions uh, which will be needed to keep a pace with the two degree scenario. Um, so I don't have time to go through all eight, but I'll take a, a deeper look into two uh, to provide some overview of the roadmap content. So biomethane can offer an alternative to fossil diesel in heavy duty road freight with several heavy duty vehicle manufacturers offering models uh, already compatible with biomethane. And when produced from wastes and residues, significant reductions on greenhouse gas emissions compared to fossil transport fuels, as well as reduced local air pollutants and noise can be uh, delivered. Uh, biomethane producing, production can also facilitate enhanced waste management and avoid direct methane emissions from feedstocks, which would have a far greater uh, global warming potential. Now, factors which enhance the potential for biomethane use include lower cost and emission transportation to the point of demand using existing natural gas grids and transparent pricing to allow a comparison at the pump with other transport fuels. Uh, we would expect the most promising opportunities uh, initially to be in captive fleets. So we're talking here about vehicles that operate on established routes and refuel at a fixed location, such as a depot. Uh, while more widespread use will require a strategic rollout of fueling infrastructure along key transport corridors. In terms of the conversion of existing fossil fuel infrastructure to bioenergy, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure such as district heating networks, cogeneration plants, industrial boilers and refineries can be converted to bioenergy. Uh, as shown on the map, uh, there are many such projects that have either been delivered already or which are in development. And these can offer reduced investment costs and quicker delivery than the equivalent capacity of new build projects. Uh, the principal driver for similar projects in the future will be a higher cost of carbon. So within the 2DS, uh, the modeling assumes a carbon price rises to $60 per tonne of CO2 in 2025. Uh, to well over $200 per tonne of CO2 in the longer term. However, it should be taken into account that given the larger scale of these projects, mobilization of fuels and feedstock supply uh, at really high scale would be required, and this obviously highlights the importance of appropriate sustainability governance. So final slide for me, I'll just mention a few policies uh, which will be needed to facilitate the rollout of these solutions more widely. So for transport solutions, carbon intensity based policies such as low carbon fuel standards applied on a technology neutral basis can create demand for fuels able to offer the deepest decarbonization relative to costs. Uh, where high levels of investment are required, financial de-risking measures such as loan guarantees or policies to provide guaranteed long term demand can mobilize private sector investment. While for several of these solutions, so for example, uh, biomass district heating and energy from waste projects, there is a really fundamental role for local governments to enable these. While overarching uh, all of these, robust sustainability governance frameworks uh, will really be needed to provide confidence to policymakers and the general public uh, in terms of the positive benefits from these uh, biomass solutions. So I'm now going to pass back to Adam, who will present the longer-term vision. Okay, we'll just uh, change places here. Um, so I will talk now about a little bit about the longer-term um, vision for bioenergy, which is in the roadmap. Um, okay. 
Um, the, 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 the vision in the roadmap is based on the IEA's energy technology perspectives modeling, um, which was uh, redone in, and published in 2017, in about June or July. Um, the modeling this year uh, looks at three different scenarios. It looks at, um, at um, a first scenario, which is, is where there's an assumption that all the current um, uh, initiatives and promises that have been made, for example, the commitments under the Paris Agreement, are actually, um, are actually fulfilled. And this reference technology scenario here, you can see that does a good job in that it stabilizes uh, global CO2 emissions, but it doesn't uh, significantly reduce them over a period. Uh, the second scenario, this one here, is the 2DF scenario, which is, as Farrow said, this is a scenario which gives you a 50% chance of keeping global temperatures below 2 degrees. And in order to deliver that, um, then you need a full portfolio of technology options. You need a lot more energy efficiency, you need renewables, you need some fuel switching, some nuclear, and some carbon capture and storage. And, um, this is not an a la carte menu. If you want to uh, achieve these ambitious CO2 reductions, you need the full portfolio. And then for the first time this year, we also looked at uh, another scenario, the beyond two degree scenario, um, which is really looking at what happens if you maximize the use of the, the, the portfolio of technology we, we have at the, uh, our disposal. And this gets you somewhere halfway between two degrees and one and a half degrees, this beyond two degree scenario. And again, you need the full portfolio of, of technologies, but in this scenario, carbon capture and storage plays an important role, including capturing carbon capture and storage associated with bioenergy. Uh, but the, the, the main point here is that these, these are ambitious scenarios, difficult to achieve, and actually you need uh, the full portfolio of technologies, including bioenergy, which plays a role in the renewables part, in fuel switching, and also in the carbon capture and storage system, particularly in the B2DS scenario. Uh, if you look at the contribution from bioenergy to these reduction, reduction emissions, you see that as you go from the RTS to the 2DS scenario, um, about 17% of the savings come from bioenergy. And if you go to the below 2 degree S scenario, then again, there's a, a similar level of contribution um, in that to that second wedge. Um, so you see that bioenergy is, is a, a, a very important part of the portfolio of technologies you need in, uh, to achieve these low carbon scenarios, to the point we would say that, that, that you really can't have a low carbon scenario without a significant uh, greater contribution from uh, bioenergy. And this actually is, is not just true of the IEA scenarios, but nearly all low carbon scenarios feature a, a big jump in bioenergy. Now, what, what happens to bioenergy in this scenario? If we go from where we are now in 2015 to 2060, you see, first of all, the graph seems to go a little bit scrambled, but you can see, that first of all, the, the overall contribution grows by the factor of, two, this is contribution to final energy consumption grows by about a factor of four. Um, but you also see that the distribution changes from a relatively small contribution now in the transport sector to uh, a much bigger contribution, about 10 times in terms both of the absolute amount from about 3 to 30 exajoules and also um, a similar jump in, in the proportion of transport fuel provided in this way. The other sectors grow as well, but it's the transport sector where bioenergy plays the most important role. And this is partly because we, we took the view that the, the total amount of bioenergy you can have would be 
is likely to be constrained. And so you want to use that bioenergy in areas where there are less other alternatives to provide low carbon solutions. And that's particularly true of the transport sector. So if we look at the overall transport sector, here you can see the, the split of the different fuels. At the bottom here you have the, the fossil fuels, which are all declining. Um, you have a big jump in bioenergy, as I've mentioned, and you also have a very significant increase in the amount of electricity used in the sector. There's often a rather sterile debate about we don't need bioenergy because we can electrify everything, or we don't need electricity because we can use uh, bioenergy, uh, but this is a sterile debate because actually these technologies are complementary with electricity particularly used in urban situations and for, for local transport and biofuels used particularly in the marine and transport sectors, so these are complementary. You see also that in the scenario the total demand is uh, more or less levels off and goes down a little bit and that's because of the important role of energy efficiency and engine efficiency and things like that. So this is a portfolio of technologies, each has its role, including biofuels. Uh, if you look at the electricity generation, you see at the bottom here uh, the role of fossil fuel technologies. Most of this generation uh, is associated with carbon capture and storage in the 2DS scenario. You see a huge jump in other renewables, particularly uh, wind and solar, uh, and then a modest expansion in biomass. Uh, you can see there the total amount of bioelectricity goes up by about sevenfold, and bioenergy goes from about two to seven percent of electricity generation. Here, the, um, bioenergy is complementing the big growth in solar and, and wind. Uh, where it can provide uh, some uh, grid management services and so on and so forth. And particularly in some cases, there is very low cost bioenergy available, which means that bioenergy can be a cost effective solution. Uh, now, if you look at the difference between 2015 and 2060 for modern bioenergy, you can see the, the trends we said before, uh, industry growing significantly, transport particularly growing, electricity growing, and so on and so forth. Um, what's important is that not only to look at now and at the end of the modeling period, but also to look in the, in the middle. And if you look at 2030, you see there's already by then in the modeling uh, a very significant increase. Overall, there's about a doubling of, uh, of the bioenergy contribution to final energy consumption and a tripling in the transport sector. Uh, so this means we actually really need to get on with things. Uh, if we fall behind the, the trajectory, then our chances of catching that up later get more and more limited. So um, th this isn't just something we can wait till 2045 or 2050 before doing. We need to get on and do some stuff now. So in the roadmap, we identify four areas, four key action areas. Um, first. Um, the deployment of mature options in the short term. Uh, Farrow has already talked about those. Uh, very often the discussion about bioenergy is about the rather more complex, difficult, controversial things, but are, there are some rather unglamorous technologies which we can just roll out and get on with, and we need to do that. Uh, that will only happen, though, of course, if the policy environment is correct. Secondly, uh, in the longer term, the, the, achieving this, this vision to, uh, depends on the development and deployment of a range of new technologies, particularly advanced bioenergy and bio advanced biofuels. Um, this move will uh, increase the amount of feedstock which is required and which is required to be produced in a sustainable manner very significantly, and that will need to be backed by a supportive a sustainability government system. And then lastly, um, doing this will involve, first of all, a big increase in the total amount of investment in the bioenergy sector, but also a, a much wider uh, spread of bioenergy. Uh, as Farrah indicated at the moment, it tends to be concentrated in a, a few, relatively few countries, and this needs to happen much more widely, and that will only happen 
with a lot of capacity building and uh, an international collaboration effort will be needed to do that. So these are the four main action areas. I'll just talk briefly about the last three of these. Um, first, uh, to make this contribution to the longer term, um, Bioenergy needs to find its way into the market roles where it provides particular advantages in the transport sector, in the electricity sector and so forth, but also where it's able to provide extremely good carbon performance. Otherwise, it will become part of the problem instead of part of the solution. So there the, are uh, a range of technology uh, development areas highlighted in the roadmap. Uh, we need continuing our d and to bring down costs and improve the greenhouse gas performance of existing biofuels technologies. We need to develop reliable performance from the, the existing novel biofuels plants, which are, are currently being uh, worked up. And then we need to de develop and demonstrate some new routes to the fuels which are mostly needed in the, the long-term future, so to, to substitutes for diesel and, and, and jet fuel. Uh, but we need to have much improved costs better carbon balances and better uh, greenhouse gas performance. And one important thing is to say how can we develop and identify uh, paths for cost reduction that mean that these fuels become uh, affordable when you allow for the environmental benefits in the longer term. Uh, the next area that needs a lot of attention is the feedstock area. Um, we, we looked at uh, quite a wide range of estimates of the, the availability of uh, suitable material. Of course, the, there are very wide estimates, but we, we, we looked uh, for some consensus around there. There is a contribution from municipal solid waste. Um, there is a contribution from waste, uh, other wastes and residues from agriculture. Um, some processing waste and things like that. Um, there is uh, some scope for uh, additional material from forestry operations and from, from agriculture. Um, this line here is, is something like 140 exajoules, which is what we capped the, the primary energy uh, inputs into the model at. Um, when you look at the range of uh, studies in the literature. I think if you talked about 100 exajoules, people would think that was relatively easy to achieve. If you get much above, uh, get towards 200, then people are more doubtful whether than that can be provided uh, in a sustainable manner. Um, we think that uh, waste and residues can play an important role in getting to 140 exajoules, but not enough. And that if you want to get beyond uh, that level, then we will need to find sustainable ways of getting some additional material from forestry operations, from agriculture and other potential sources. Um, of course, there's some uh, uncertainty in the amount of material that would be available, um, but we think, uh, given a, a good following wind, then it should be possible to get close to or around the 140 exajoules. Um, but it's very important that these materials are produced in line with sustainable resource management, forestry and agricultural practice. And we think there's a lot of scope for co-production of, uh, of bioenergy along with food, uh, using unproductive uh, land uh, and improved production efficiency. Um, we think an important element in helping this happen is to have a supportive sustainability government system. Uh, at the moment, sustainability government systems are principally uh, aimed at uh, stopping bad practice, ensuring carbon savings, uh, avoiding other significantly negative sustainability impacts. And of course, that is absolutely right and needed. But at the same time, we think uh, we need to go beyond that. We need to have sustainable government systems which promote best, best practice and provide stable regulatory regimes and which encourage best practice and stimulate in innovation. If we take too precautionary a principle in this, um, then that means we will rule out um, what could be perfectly good, sustainable, important contributions 
to primary uh, bioenergy supply. So some of the uh, principles which need to underpin such a sustainability government system include moving as far as we can towards systems which are based on uh, greenhouse gas performance rather than being just technology or feedstock specific. Um, principle, uh, uh, systems which build on and integrate with the wider efforts to manage sustainability in the bioeconomy. Uh, bioenergy is not alone in, in this, this area. There's food and timber and agriculture and all, all sorts of other things. Um, that recognizes regional and sectoral differences, the, the opportunities, the risks, and the government's uh, possibilities in different places and different sectors are different. And we need to recognize that. So rather than a one-size-fits-all system, and increasingly based on real-life data and feedback into best practice and regu <laughs> regulation. Now, if we're going to move to this um, enhanced bioenergy uh, situation, then the investment in the sector needs to rise very sharply. You see at the moment, investment is around $30 billion uh, a year. It goes up and down a little bit from year to year and principally in the electricity sector. If we move ahead, sorry, the, the, the rubric's gone, the blue is electricity and the green is, is transport biofuels. As we go ahead, you see there's a need to move that up sharply, to double that essentially uh, between now and 2030, and then to get up to something over 200 years billion by the end of the sector. So there's a, a, a huge investment uh, requirement need here. And that's not going to happen uh, unless um, we have the right policies in place, and um, that in turn will require uh, quite an effort in international collaboration in terms of capacity building. We have very good cooperation between the existing uh, international organizations. Mission Innovation and the Biofuel Future Platform are, are now playing important roles. There's a very important meeting next week in Delhi for those. But we need to go beyond that. We need to engage the development agencies and the funding institutions. We need to understand uh, what their requirements are for them to, to help and promote sustainable bioenergy. And then to work with them to identify regional and local opportunities, build up the, the necessary technical and regulatory cap cap capability, and build up the, the sort of enhanced uh, project pipeline. Now, none of this will happen without the right policies in place. Um, in the roadmap, we talk about three uh, elements to this. First of all, leveling uh, the policy playing field, if you like, by making sure that there aren't unbalances in the ways things are subsidized, uh, pricing in carbon externalities, removing other barriers to low carbon technologies, and so on. Secondly, uh, bioenergy, like most other renewable technologies, is, is a high capital intensive technology compared with fossil fuels. And, and the uh, investments will only happen uh, if you have a low risk investment climate. And policy has an important role to play there in providing market access, providing long term security about the market, uh, providing long term offtake arrangements, and a clear regulatory framework. If you do this, uh, this lowers investment risk, and it means actually that you can access the, 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 the technologies and the products at lower costs than if you have a, a less friendly environment. And then lastly, we need these new technologies to come through, and that will only happen if you have a policy environment which catalyzes and supports innovation, for example, with obligations for new products through things like risk mitigation uh, procedures and through continued RD and D support, and all that supported by um, the fair, stringent, and stable sustainability regime, which I mentioned before. Now, we're very keen that the, this roadmap isn't just a document that we produced and sits on the shelf. Uh, we want it to be used. Um, we're uh, pleased that we work very closely on this with IEA Bioenergy. And the, the IA Bioenergy will, will use the roadmap as uh, part of its strategic considerations for its new program. 
Uh, we're working closely with the Biofuel Future Platform and the Mission Innovation Sustainable Bioenergy Challenge to, um, to, to help them frame their, their programs in the light of the roadmap. Um, we will follow up uh, what's happening in the sector through the IEA's Clean Energy Progress Report. And we're looking at continued cooperation and coordination with a range of international organizations looking at all these factors here. We're, we're just starting a project on the cost reduction potential for advanced biofuels, uh, bioenergy in industry, um, how we can engage aid ag agencies and, and international lenders in bioenergy and so on. So this isn't the end of the story. We're hoping that this will be a useful document which we can use going forward. So, uh, in our view, sustainable bioenergy is an essential element in the portfolio of measures we need for a low-carbon scenario. If you don't have a, uh, an increase in sustainable bioenergy, we think it's very hard to have a low-carbon scenario. Uh, biofuels can play a particularly important role um, in the transport sector. Um, progress is much slower than, than necessary, so we need to get on with deployment of existing technologies commercialize the new technologies, uh, develop sustainable supply chains and the right governance regimes, and build up technical and regulatory capacity in a much broader range of countries and regions. And lastly, if you don't have the right policy frameworks in place, then um, uh, none of this is going to happen. So that the policy development is a, is a, a key element. If you want to uh, access the roadmap, you can. It's free online. You can see the link here. And here are a number of other um, IEA products which uh, support uh, the, the roadmap. The ETP modeling is here. Uh, the, the, the market report, which reports on recent developments, is there. The, the how-to guide, which Simon uh, Simone mentioned, and so on. So uh, that's all we have time for now, and we're very happy to proceed to answer uh, a few questions if you have them. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone. So we will now unmute the lines for a question period. Just one moment, please. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted. So to ask a question over the phone, please state where uh, Please state your name, where you are calling from, and then address the question. Uh, we also recommend directing any uh, questions towards the chat pod in the middle of the screen. Ronnie, this is Jim Spaeth. Can I make a brief comment? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to Adam and Farrow for their leadership of this effort. Uh, it was a tremendous effort uh, under a very tight time frame, and uh, they did a terrific job. I also want to point out that it was an excellent example of cooperation between IEA headquarters, the IEA Bioenergy TCP, as well as our colleagues and many other international organizations. And it will be very valuable to the IEA Bioenergy TCP in aiding our plans for strategic directions in the next triennium, as well as the longer term and as we develop our next strategic plan, our next five-year strategic plan, it'll be a very valuable guide and resource and, and vision document. So just a big thank you to all the folks uh, that had a hand in producing the document. I think it's very valuable. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. So now uh, another reminder that the floor is open for any questions and comments. All right, so we have our first question from Robert. Did you look into the potential for bioenergy integrated with food production, so i.e. Uh, biomass heated greenhouse, uh, greenhouses combined with conventional agriculture? So that's our first question from Robert. We, uh, of, of course, in the roadmap, we uh, can't go into enormous amounts of detail um, about the specific uh, measures which, which, we, uh, which, which can be taken. 
Um, but we we did highlight the the important role for um, for bioenergy, well, for, for for much better collaboration, if you like, between food production and bioenergy. Uh, already in the food sector and, and the agricultural sector, a lot of the, some residues are used for for energy production, and that that's obviously a, a cost-effective, uh, sensible thing to do. Uh, and I'm sure that the, the, there's much scope for for more of that sort of approach. Great, right, thank you. Our next question comes from Stanley. What do you mean by balanced subsidies? Can you elaborate a little bit more on this? So this is from Stanley. Uh, yes, the, um, it, it, this is part of our leveling the playing field, if you like. Um, very often there are, there are countries who uh, want to do something about, their, uh, about changing their energy system. They want to have a more sustainable energy system. Um, but very often, uh, when you, you dig into the detail, you find that actually fossil fuels are still quite strongly subsidized, and then uh, to, to a larger extent than bioenergy or some other renewable sources. So it, it, it's really about having a coherence in the policy framework to, to say that if you want to move in the direction of having a more sustainable energy system, then you should um, probably look hard about, to, about the extent to which you're um, supporting uh, fossil-based industries and certainly not support the fossil-based industries uh, more strongly than you are the uh, sustainable uh, technologies, including bioenergy. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Ben. Is someone from is someone from IEA or DOE to present this material to organizations promoting deployment? Uh, I could offer some feedback. This is Jim Space. We'd be happy to present this at uh, opportunities as they come up where there's an interest. And of course, this is an IEA product, IEA, an IEA bioenergy product, uh, not a DOE product. But DOE is a very active member of the IEA bioenergy TCP. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, moving on to our next question from Jeff. Would like to see more focus. Okay, so I think this is more of a comment. Would like to see more focus on the role a, a substantial revenue neutral carbon tax can play. Price will drive innovation and substitution. Um, anyone uh, want to add to uh, that? We, yeah, we can add a, a comment on that. Uh, so the, the longer term vision is underpinned by uh, what we call the two degree scenario, which was explained, and this within it. Um, requires to drive that uh, level of change that is required to keep global temperature increase to two degrees uh, requires a substantial uh, cost of, of carbon. Um, so this, within the two degree scenario, in the long term, this ramps up to over $200 uh, dollars per ton of CO2. So really, although a high carbon price isn't the only measure, uh, required, so therefore we, we were talking about other policy measures you can do and other technical factors that need to come in to realize this vision for bioenergy. Uh, it certainly is uh, factored in um, and is important. Um, so if you take the case of, of Sweden where the carbon tax is, well, the price on, on fossil fuels and, and carbon, well over $100 uh, per ton of CO2, and there you can see very high shares of bioenergy, for example, in the heating, uh, district heating, etc. So we recognize the effects that a carbon price can have, and it's built into the, the uh, longer term vision within the roadmap. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think, I think it, is, it is an important uh, element, but it may not in itself be sufficient, uh, particularly to drive change at the, at the rate we need. For example, just having a carbon tax isn't in itself enough to drive uh, the innovation and to, to open up market opportunities for some of these new technologies, you need complementary measures. So we, while not underplaying the important role of carbon pricing, um, it, 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 it's one tool in, in, a, in, in, a tool, in a more complicated toolkit you need to, to really help these technologies into the market, particularly if you want that to happen uh, rather quickly rather than very slowly. All right, thank you very much. So moving on to our next question. This is from Gaston. 
when you consider efficiency demonstrating a slight decrease in overall consumption due to efficiencies, do you consider global growth over time, population, and so on and so forth? Um, so, so in the, the, the modeling for, for the 2DS, yes, yeah, so, so what, the, the way it's kind of broken down is the first thing you do is you look at the demand. So things like population increase, things like GDP increase, uh, these longer terms, uh, things that factor demand, are, are built out. And then the first thing you take away from that is the, the efficiency measures. Uh, so then you, you take the, the demand out what it is, what that equates to in terms of emissions, and then the first slice to come away is the energy efficiency, and then you, you start to build in the other solutions which cost more. Uh, so the second slice we would be uh, in terms of the renewables and more the technology options. So within the long-term vision presented, the opportunities for energy efficiency are, are maximized. Um, and the growth, uh, the demand growth is projected out. It's certainly not kept stable at today's rates. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question, okay, from guest number four. Uh, have the USA, states of California, Oregon, and Washington communicated with the IEA on developing supportive legislation? Um, we, we certainly have had uh, some discussions with representatives from, from California and from the other states, and if you look in the roadmap, you'll see um, there's a box about low-carbon fuel standards in general, which are implied in, in, in those uh, areas and elsewhere, and we think there's some very good examples of some, some policies which have a lot of very good features uh, in those areas. So we, we have had some discussions, and we, we are are quite well aware of the, of the development but there and take those into, into account when we look at uh, uh, good, good and best practice uh, development. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question from Sam. Hi, I work for the UK's Committee on Climate Change and we are current, uh, one second, sorry. Where did it go? Okay, sorry about that. Hi, I work for the UK's Committee on Climate Change, and we are currently looking at the future of bioenergy in the UK. Could you say more about your methodology for projecting potential future global supply of sustainable bioenergy feedstocks and the assumptions that underpin this? Or is this information available some uh, elsewhere? Thank you. So this is a question from Sam. Thanks. I, th I think you have to look in the roadmap to see how we did this. Basically, uh, we weren't able to do a huge amount of um, new research ourselves. So what we did, we, we basically did uh, a, lit a literature review, uh, looked at a range of um, various global estimates. Um, we looked at some more recent analysis, which, is, which has, has taken uh, some of those and has, has very much narrowed down the the range of uh, uh, potential uh, estimates from, from each of the sources and based our long-term analysis on, on the best data that's available. We also looked at, at a number of regional studies which have been done, like the, the billion ton study in the US, uh, um, some work done uh, for the European Commission and so on and so forth. To, to benchmark those global long-term areas uh, uh, estimates against some estimates which we made on a on a more local basis, it's actually a pretty difficult thing to do because the, there are such a wide range of estimates, and when you look in detail at the studies, they're all pretty much done on a different basis. So, so so making sense of this is is pretty difficult. We would argue that uh, we've recommended in the report there needs to be more work to look at longer-term global potential, but to, particularly that this needs to be done in a, uh, on, on a regional basis because then you can really look at the regional differences, but it also needs to be done in a way, uh, in a consistent way, so that you can take the various regional analyses and um, start to look at how, how they, they build up all together. Um, so we, 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 uh, that, that was the, the 
the approach we, we took. Of course, there are uncertainties. Uh, uh, everything in 2060 is uncertain, but certainly exactly how much bioenergy and exactly where it might come from uh, is uncertain. Um, you will see in, in the report we, we, we decided not to, to sort of come up with a definitive plan of exactly where every last exajoule could come from. Um, but we did enough, I think, to satisfy ourselves that there is a fair chance you could get the, the uh, amount of bioenergy you need and that you could get that uh, while staying well within the bounds of the sustainability practice. All right, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll just finish up all the questions that are currently on the screen. So uh, just something to uh, make a note of. So as a follow-up comment to Sam, uh, guest number four, Sam Friggins, this is Greg Shipley in California. Please contact me about a UK project we have already. So uh, Sam, there's a contact uh, email on screen that you can uh, get in touch with. Moving on to our next question from Fan Ran. Thanks for the lecture. Just wondering what's your views on the future of biofuel production from MSW and what is the main barrier for the technology development? Uh, hi there. Um, so here, when, when we're talking about the, this type of biofuel uh, from the thermochemical groups, we're talking about fuels produced for, for the diesel pool. So for particularly important for road freight, for the marine uh, applications, um, potentially also for, in terms of jet fuel. Um, and why this is particularly important, so it, it's a good question, um, is because opening up feedstocks such as municipal solid waste and other lignocellulosic feedstocks will really take the pressure off the, the low carbon feedstocks that can be used now, such as the, the waste uh, oils and animal fats, etc which can be processed into biodiesel or, or um, renewable diesel or HVO, uh, different terminology. Um, but there's only so much of these, they're finite, there's a lot of competition. So, so yes, this uh, technology is very important. Um, there are some examples of this being done already. There's a, there's a plant called Enochem in, in Canada. Um, there's also um, there's other smaller applications as well using uh, thermochemical technologies. Uh, however, it's not as well uh, along the path to commercialization as other advanced biofuels, for example, uh, cellulosic ethanol, et cetera. Um, so certainly there are, there are technical challenges there um, that need to be addressed, but uh, it's right to, to flag this up because particularly it opens up all these new feedstocks that will be needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question from Holly. Do you think CCUS will come forward without incentives for negative emissions production for developers? Um, basically, uh, I think the answer is probably no. Um, both for carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and use, then actually uh, we think that uh, one of the drivers that would really lead to those uh, technologies coming forward is, is a sort of high carbon price. Um, and without that, I think the market prospects for, for those in, in the, the short term are probably uh, quite low. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question from Jim. What assumptions are made in 2DS and B2DS scenarios about leveraging petroleum refinery infrastructure to increase capacity slash rate of production of co-processed, uh, in brackets, with petroleum feedstocks uh, advanced biofuels? Um, so in terms of the short-term uh, options, uh, as one of the slides I presented, one of these is using existing uh, fossil uh, infrastructure. Um, the, the main focus was around converting these um, in a situation where you have a high carbon price, it's no longer economical to operate them, and then exploring if you can uh, have lower investment costs for bioenergy from these. Um, we also looked at a wider range of kind of linked solutions to these, of which co-processing was one. So it is recognized in the roadmap. 
Um, but certainly uh, it's not possible with the, across the whole energy system with a wider array of different technology options to explore and maximize each one in detail. So I think it's fair to say that crow processing uh, is not uh, individually uh, focused on within the, the EPP uh, modeling which uh, underpins the roadmap. But uh, it's certainly recognized that there's potential there about using existing uh, infrastructure and certainly a lower cost route to, to producing uh, more uh, bio-based uh, transport fuels. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question. This is from Jen Ping from UBC. In the roadmap, the technology readiness level of excuse me, co-processing pyrolysis bio-oil is higher than standalone pyrolysis bio-oil upgrading? We're just, we're, just, we're just checking out the chart. Hang on. Oh, would, would you like me to uh, go back to a certain slide? No, no, it's okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's, it's actually a, a table in the roadmap rather than one, one we produced. I think I think this was because we uh, our understanding was that there are actually uh, a number of reasonably uh, large scale uh, operations already in place where uh, um, pyrolysis oil is being uh, um, co-pressed with, with crude oil. This goes back to the last question. Um, whereas our understanding was that. Uh, standalone applications are not quite as advanced, but um, things move quite quickly and maybe, maybe uh, there, there isn't as strong a difference as we indicated in the roadmap. Thank you. Moving on to our next question from Robert. Your analysis obviously is tied to the assumption of a 2DS or 1.5DS scenario. What happens under something like 25 Yes, or higher. Um, yes, if you um, if you look, for example, at the role of bioenergy in the reference technology scenario, which is, is the, uh, the highest of those, um, there you're talking about a scenario which is, is um, we used to call it the four degree scenario, but it's a bit lower than that now. It's probably three and a, three and a half, something like that. Um, then there is a significant increase in bioenergy under that scenario. Um, the, the, the total primary bioenergy supply goes up to rather than 140 in the um, in the 2DS and B2DS scenarios. It goes up to about 90 uh, exajoules from memory. Um, if you look in the uh, Energy Technology Perspectives 2017 uh, report, uh, there's a chapter there on bioenergy. Um, which uh, talks in more detail about the role of bioenergy in each of the three scenarios. So if you if you look at that, you'll you'll get uh, chapter and verse on uh, on how what role bioenergy plays in those uh, more carbon intensive scenarios. All right. Thank you. Moving on to our next question from the Leap. Could you elaborate on the biofuel production potential without indirect land use? I luck impact globally, for example, lignocellulosic biomass slash residues. I missed part of the lecture. Can the lecture material be available? So I can answer part of that. Um, so the lecture material, including the recording as well as the slides, will be published on the IEA Bioenergy website as well as the CIF, IFC website. So um, just visit either websites or you can also write an email to uh, I'll, I'll type it out later, but electures at cif-ifc.org, and I'd be happy to send you the material after they are available. And I will pass it to Adam and Farrow for the remaining of the question. Uh, hi there. So in, in terms of the volumes that are discussed in, in the vision, this isn't really the production potential. This is the required volume of, of certain fuel uh, within that application, uh, which is very, very uh, low carbon and sufficient enough to give the to meet the, the longer term vision. So, in terms of the, the, the question, the, the, the amounts shown aren't really production potential. Now, obviously, within uh, cellulosic uh, fuels, you have to look at this, the the individual feedstock availability, and it's really we, we presented here some global values to discuss how much 
uh, could be available there. But really, what what happened needs to happen now is for individual countries and regions to then take the roadmap and produce their own uh, analysis based on the in situ situation of what those um, what the resources are. So there's lots of studies at a higher level saying, okay, globally you could have X or Y amount of this certain feedstocks, but really uh, this this roadmap does not present every single analysis of individual regions. What we really hope is that it will be used um, along with the how-to guide for bioenergy to produce more detailed analysis about what is the best option uh, based on the feedstock and resource availability per regional country. Yes, if, if you look at the, the amount that we assume might be available from waste and residues, it's around 90 exajoules, I think, from, from memory. Um, so it's, it's a significant proportion of the total you need, but it's not enough in itself to get up to, um, to the level of supply you would need to underpin the, the, the level of, uh, of bioenergy uh, in the roadmap. Uh, but we also believe there is significant potential uh, from parts of the forestry sector, from other parts of the agricultural sector, to produce um, additional materials without significant uh, indirect, direct or indirect land use change uh, possibilities. For example, there's a lot of land which is um, underused at the moment, uh, where productivity could be increased. There's a lot of land uh, which uh, where actually growing uh, bioenergy could, could actually be part of a, of a of, of a solution to bringing back land into production or, or, or so on and so forth. So, so um, we, we, we think as well as the waste and residues, there is significant scope for additional materials to come uh, without um, causing uh, significant direct or indirect land use change. All right, thank you. So our final two questions, uh, one's from Manus. Thanks for the informative session. I work with the bioenergy team in FAO. I think a key problem in achieving a sustainable bioenergy development is a clear understanding of biomass supply potentially, in brackets, crop residues, animal residues, etc. Are you aware of any tools that can help estimate these potentials? So FAO, in brackets, has one BEFS, but I think we need more or collaborate to develop more. Uh, yes, I uh, agree this is an important issue. In, in the roadmap, we actually specifically mentioned the BEFS as, as a good example of a, a methodology that can be used to help ide identify uh, sustainable biomass potential on a national or regional level. Um, and, and, and certainly, yes, there, there is some scope for uh, both for using that more widely, but also uh, um, improving the, the methodologies and, and, and good practice and we, we would, I, I think it's one of the recommendations in the report that there needs to be more effort uh, put into that sector. All right. Um, our final question comes from Sarah. Do you have any plans in how to integrate other plan, or other parts of the bioeconomy specifically in assessing sustainability? Um, I think this is uh, this is very important as, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, um, sustainability isn't just a bioenergy question; it's it's a, a question about sustainable forestry, about sustainable agriculture, more generally about sustainable use of land, about sustainable waste management practice, and uh, it, it's not very sensible for bioenergy to try and do its own thing all the time when there are a lot of other global initiatives or, or national initiatives um, looking at sustainability ac across all these sectors. So we would argue strongly that, that there needs to be some joined up thinking on this. I think within the IEA Bioenergy uh, TCP um, the, the, there are plans for uh, a specific task on sustainability issues and for, I understand that, that this uh, um, the, the importance of, of collaboration and of sustainability across the whole bioeconomy is, is, is part of the thinking uh, beyond that. So I, I think this, this important topic will be taken up as part of that uh, initiative. 
right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those were uh, all of our questions. Just two more comments, uh, follow-up comments. Uh, Jeff, from Jeff, good comments regarding the role of a significant carbon tax as a necessary complement to the other policy measures. Thank you. And then another follow-up uh, comment from Sam. Thank you for that, Adam. It would be extremely helpful to the CCC's current work if you might be available to discuss with me further. I'd also be happy to tell you about the CCC's current bioenergy work. If you're interested, I'll reach out to you or if you can reach, uh, email me on uh, the email information is on screen right now. And so with that, I think in the interest of time, and we've kind of uh, gone through all of our questions, and so um, if there are no more con nothing else to add or, or comment, I would like to uh, bring this session to a close. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's